episode of Conversations with Jeff, and I'm really excited that we have our guest uh, this week, who is Tom Littleton. Uh, he's a pastor. He's, uh, you know, he's really been leading the way in a lot of these issues, whether it's Revoice or dealing with social justice and just a lot of the compromise. And so he's really been a leading voice. And so I'm very thankful to have Tom on. Welcome to the show, Tom. Jeff, uh, thanks. Good to be with you. I appreciate you having me on. Of course. And, you know, and, and again, just kind of like what I do with everybody the first time I have them on the show is I'd love for you to just kind of share your testimony, how, you know, how God saved you. And I uh, just would love that chance for people to kind of hear that story and hear your background a little bit. Well, I'm in my 40th year in uh, in the kingdom, in the faith. And um, so I was saved when I was really young. I was 17 but uh, not before I had <clears throat> uh, misspent much of my youth. Uh, when uh, when I was growing up, it was the 60s. I was born in 61, so I had a front row seat for the sexual revolution, and the you know the free love and uh, uh, the drug culture, all that. So very soon uh, I jumped in full force and uh, at a very young age and. Our family had a, a like a local spot that was on the lake that was where everybody came to hang out. So between the music and the culture and the um, the excess, uh, I was really on a uh, path to, to destruction. My parents divorced, and I got very rebellious, very angry. And um, so by the time I was about 15, I really it was uh, just about gone. I didn't think I would live to be 20. And I was pretty much resigned to that. Mm -hmm. And um, God began to, he saved my brother, who began to witness to me. Uh, my brother then was called into ministry. And so once he left to go to, to college, I thought, well, I've got the house all to myself, and I don't have to deal with all, you know, this uh, this Christian anymore. Mm -hmm. And um, and then a couple of my friends were saved. And so everywhere I went, there was <laughs> this, it was God sort of divine invasion. Right. And I came to faith uh, then in the middle of my uh, 17th year as I dropped out of high school and finished with a GED and gone into business because I just stayed in so much trouble in school. It, it wasn't doing me much good. And so um, I was saved during the uh, December of what would have been my senior year. And I immediately was thrown into evangelistic ministry. I started going out and sharing my testimony with people and reaching out to the people I had uh, known and even went back and started mending, you know, relationships and stuff um, and making restitution in some areas I had really done people wrong and devouring the word of God. And I got into evangelism I immediately knew what I was called to do and since that time I've uh, seen a lot of other areas of ministry open up a lot of pastoral care and I do a lot of uh, funerals a lot of weddings and uh, provide sort of a pastor at large capacity to a lot of the unchurched people in my area mm -hmm. and I traveled throughout the US um, and uh, Latin America and uh, Europe uh, doing evangelism and also doing medical missions. My wife's a dentist. We have a nine-year-old son. It's his birthday today. Happy uh, birthday. But, uh, <laughs> oh, thank you. Thank you. He's loving it. Yeah. But, um, but that's what uh, I started doing apologetics. Um, uh, I would talk to people about how to share their faith. And then that's evolved into, as the church has gone down some of this troubling road since about 2012, I've been doing a lot of Christian apologetic on worldview regarding the LGBT agenda. I do a, a lot of the uh, writing that you mentioned. So all that just to say that you know my life is ordered around ministry, but I'm also a business guy. So I support the, my ministry habit, as I jokingly call it, uh, with uh, the business, mm -hmm. I'm able to uh, be um, blessed to be as a bivocational person, not to have to fear retribution within the ministry, right. which I think has helped, you know, and a lot of my friends who are more in the institutional church 
I don't have the freedom to speak up that I do, but uh, honestly, I'm a street preacher. So Mm -hmm. come what may, uh, I have to speak the truth. And, you know, I've, I've had knives in my ribs and, you know, and guns in my back and been in some of the most uh, hideous uh, places in New York city and inner cities uh, like that, uh, you know, doing the gospel. And so uh, what's going on in the church is really um, secondary to my calling, but we're yeah. all part of the body of Christ. And it's not something I can walk away from or would be uh, willing to um, you know, remain silent on the things that we're facing today. Right, which is interesting because you were saying that, you know, your background's in apologetics. And a lot of times when you're dealing with apologetics, you're dealing with um, how am I going to be de- interacting with non-Christians and unbelievers in, in trying to bring them to the gospel? But what's interesting is I feel like the, the your study in apologetics is really helping to protect the church from within in all, in all reality. And because a lot of these liberal ideologies are beginning to infiltrate into the church. Uh, one of the questions that I had for you was, you know, your website is 30piecesofsilver.org. How did you come up with that title and that name for your website and kind of what kind of led up to that? Well, I, you know, the, the worst thing I want to do if I'm going to be a disciple is end up being a Judas, mm-hmm. uh, where I would put a price on my Savior, you know, and a, a price on my faith. And I really felt as a, I self-examined uh, my own heart, if, uh, you know, if there was any thing that I would be willing to, you know, compromise any cost or price that I would put on these things. I had, you know, I knew there was going to be a lot of opposition and this wasn't going to be fun, Mm -hmm. uh, especially back about 2010 when I first saw it. And then 2012, when I really got thrown into the middle of this stuff. Um, And so I had to pay the price and count the cost and pay the price then. And I committed to the Lord, there, there are no 30 pieces of silver for me. Mm -hmm. And um, and then uh, from that, I began to understand that there were way too many in the ministry and even among friends of mine who were willing to compromise. There was a, a price on their obedience. And I, mean, I think we're all called to to take this stuff on if mm-hmm. we see it. Right. And yet there's so few people doing it. So I guess it implies, you know, are we going to be a Judas? Is there a price that we're willing to to place on our Lord and on faithfulness to him and our own faith? Um, Of course, the answer needs to be no, an emphatic no. I mean, it shouldn't be a consideration, but uh, that's kind of where we are. I think uh, there's so much money in the mix with uh, Soros money coming into the church, Paul Mm -hmm. Singer and others who are funding a lot of these agendas. Uh, and we we're kind of wrapping them, cloaking them in a, a few Bible verses and calling them gospel issues. A lot of people are selling out. Mm-hmm. So that's that's where I got the name from. Yeah, for sure. And, and, you know, I first heard about you and met you through the conversation that was happening around v, uh, Revoice and the and gay Christianity and that sort of thing. Uh, but you were saying that, you know, you, you first started kind of seeing a lot of this kind of stuff as far back as 2010. What were you seeing back then? Um, that I'm sure clearly has really exploded into what we're seeing today. But what really drew you into dealing with a lot of this kind of stuff? Well, in 2010, I first started hearing the idea of same-sex attraction in Christianity. And to me, it hit me like, wow, this is like Alcoholics Anonymous for for gays. Mm -hmm. You 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 know, once you're gay, you're always gay. And indeed, that's exactly what was going on. I know more of that now from what's happened with Christian, uh, some Christian psychologists who are very influential in this conversation um, because of the assertion of orientation or sexual orientation. If, if that were real, then people can't change. And so that's what we saw to the buildup in 2013 of the collapse of Exodus International, which we now know more the players behind the scenes who are involved in that. That was all strategic, but I saw this invading the church in 2010, and I said, this is new language. Where did it come from? Uh, I dug into and found some of the Lausan movement uh, documents that were being put together for the South African meetings, and they were all uh, full of this uh, same-sex attracted language, which was when I then started hearing it from some of the guys like Sam Alberry, who's brought in some of this most recent mm-hmm. disturbing stuff. I actually asked him because his book in 2013 was given to the teens at our church 
uh, by a staff member without parental approval. Okay. And uh, I said, so where, where do you, I said, Sam, where do you get SSA? What does that mean? Where does it come from? He said, well, it's just a less uh, accusing or a nicer way to say gay. Mm -hmm. So when you're saying I'm a same-sex attracted Christian, you mean you're saying I'm a gay Christian. Right. And he, he confirmed that. So we're we're in the midst of this, you know, barrage of rhetoric. It's like we're standing under Niagara as the stuff is coming at us from, you know, from all points. And so suddenly the conversation is being changed and a lot of new uh, uh, terminology introduced. I then found in 1987, uh, as far back as then, in Emory University, there was a group put together to provide a narrative for a gay identity in a variety of faiths, mm -hmm. including uh, LDS, Catholic, Evangelical. And um, I found a guy, uh, Scott Thuma, who was working in 1987 to negotiate is what his um, his little uh, uh, thesis is called to negotiate a gay Christian identity and it was all the same language mm -hmm. and pushing toward you know the idea that you can be both gay and Christian and that's where we are now after five years of it being fully uh, infiltrated in the Southern Baptist and conservative uh, PCA. Uh, reform movement, in particular, Gospel Coalition. Everybody believes that you can be gay and Christian. Yeah. And if you substitute other sins with that, it just doesn't hold water. I mean, can you be a pedophile Christian? Can mm -hmm. you be a an incestuous attracted Christian? Mm -hmm. um, I mean, it's absurd. Yeah. I mean, I mean, even even if you go into less of the blatant sins, whether it's you know, like you're not going to identify yourself as like a lying Christian or a stealing Christian right. or whatever it is, and so it's interesting that within this one area of sin, all of a sudden now you're allowed to identify with your sin. It just sorry, we can't do anything about it. Um, but mm -hmm. but what's interesting to me, and you were kind of touching on it right there, is how much of this is also incorporating other religions, whether it's Mormonism or Catholicism or, you know, or whatever it is. And it's interesting because, you know, especially within the Reform Movement, within the Southern Baptist, um, they've always been very, uh, obviously, biblically minded, solid theology, you know, the, exclusive, the ex exclusivity of Christ. And so why is it that all of a sudden now it's, we're bringing in all these quote unquote experts from, you know, whether it's Catholicism or now incorporating Mormonism into the, all this kind of stuff. How, how are, are these guys okay with that kind of stuff? Yeah, it's, it's really puzzling if indeed they are the, the, um, the guys who are committed to biblical theology that they uh, assert themselves to be. Uh, that is the basis on which we trust them and have allowed them into our lives and our churches. That's why we attend their conferences and read their books and their blogs. And, you know, we're being inundated with this, um, all this information from these guys. And we trust them because they say that they're uh, committed to the inerrancy of scripture and to uh, biblical systematic theology. Mm -hmm. And um, which there's a distinction between the two, but uh, we're trusting them to be biblical in their convictions. Mm -hmm. and historic in their theology. But uh, because of that trust, that uh, sort of unquestioned trust, I think they've been able to advance this. And I'm not saying uh, that I can judge people's hearts, whether they were, you know, in, in, uh, had good intentions in the beginning, whether their intentions are no longer good, or whether they uh, were just off the rails and, and uh, were confidence men and scamming us uh, mm -hmm. to, uh, to, uh, to gain that confidence. But I can say this. We're definitely being hustled now. Right. It's reached the point where we're being hustled when we see the introduction of uh, this church audit that I write about that comes mm -hmm. from Sam Alberry and Living Out that's endorsed by Tim and Kathy Keller that we now see uh, being brought to the states and, in, in, and uh, inflicted on two Southern Baptist congregations and a third church up in uh, Cambridge, Massachusetts, all of which are nine Mark's church. That's Mark Dever. Mm -hmm. And so it's, uh, and there's a lot of overlap there because he's involved with together for the gospel and the gospel coalition. So, you know, this um, audit is something that will impose a, uh, it's self-imposed, but at the moment, but it imposes sort of a politically correct 
uh, you know, view on churches about uh, how we talk about the LGBT topic from the pulpit or from private conversation or even attitudes and, um, you know, and, and anything that would reflect a stereotypical thought pattern. Uh, and our kids could be subjected to this. Mm-hmm. It also says our, our kids should be, should be subjected to this broader definition of family as the church uh, yeah. that we should share our kids and share our resources. So there's a lot of disturbing junk here that all of a sudden is just put out here and we're supposed to absorb it. And for some reason, a guy like Mark Dever, who I talked to at the Southern Baptist Convention, I asked him about Revoice. He said, I'm not following that. I don't get into all the kind of politics stuff. Mm-hmm. And I said, well, this is more of a moral issue. It's not yeah. a political issue. But um, I watched uh, Mark set up. I was on the phone off and doing interviews near his nine mark setup. He's got a lot of young men gathered around him and looking to him and mm-hmm. planning churches and his association. And, uh, you know, and so when leaders do something really bad like this, it influences a lot of the people who look to them. Yeah. Oh, yeah. And, and a lot of people, you know, and I think that there is kind of this celebrity worship within the church today. And so what ends up happening is you have people that are basing their beliefs and their theology based on what their favorite pastor is saying instead, instead of necessarily what the Bible is saying. Um, you know, one of the things that, you know, I did, I, you know, I printed out that the church audit, um, about, you know, there was like 10 questions uh, that you're supposed to ask about your church. And the one that you had mentioned was point number nine, which was, Church family members instinctively share meals, homes, holidays, festivals, money, and children with others from different backgrounds and life situations to them. I mean, that seems very disturbing, concerning, like almost like socialism happening within the church. It's it's very concerning. I mean, that that's now being promoted within, you know, these quote unquote good guys as churches now. Yeah. Well, what they're really moving us toward is socialism. It's uh, it takes a village. Mm -hmm. It takes a village, a village church. It takes a gay affirming village church. Mm -hmm. Uh, And we're not buying it. I mean, I'm not buying it. And anybody in the sound of my voice, I'm going to scream to, you know, till I don't have a voice to uh, to say we can't do this because this is socialism for the Mm -hmm. church. And you know, there are a number of things in play, like the faith-based partnerships, you know, the government government funding coming into churches. You know, even with what's happened in North Carolina right now, a friend wrote me about how the churches are all working with FEMA. Well, that all began in uh, back in um, uh, 2005 with uh, the faith-based partnerships under Bush after Hurricane Katrina. Mm-hmm. That's just standard fare now. The churches are like uh, basically operating as extensions of federal agencies and contractors to deliver uh, the you know the goods for those who are in crisis. And you might say, what's wrong with that? There was nothing wrong with the work. What's wrong is the partnership, you mm-hmm. know, and coming under government. Uh, socialist type controls. So, the church just doesn't belong there. We right. don't. We're not an agency of the government, um, and we can't work with their money mm-hmm. because they're going to restrict us from ministry. And yet, a lot of respected ministries and denominational ministries are doing this. They've been doing it for some time. Mm-hmm. But uh, you know, the, the idea of redefining family goes back, and I point this out in the article, most recent article about Al Mohler and this whole family discussion and this audit. Uh, is it's definitely coming from the same circles where our, um, you know, from our seminaries where the social justice narratives have gone uh, in, especially since about 2013, and they're pushing this narrative that, um, you know, the, the church has to be this vehicle of delivering social justice and that that's our job. And it's confusing the gospel with this idea of social justice. So then it has these you know, LGBT narratives, racial narratives, uh, immigrant, you know, and refugee narratives, uh, the feminist Me Too narrative, uh, all needing their call for justice to be satisfied by mm-hmm. the church. The bigger problem that we face is most of this stuff is happening, especially the influx of money from outside the church, that uh, uh, it's going on without any detection from the average person in the pew. Mm-hmm. And if we knew how much our uh, local 
associations, ministerial associations, parachurch ministries, and even some of our churches and, and denominational missions programs have gotten into outside funding, both activists, you know, people like Soros and, mm-hmm. and these uh, very left-wing uh, uh, foundations and right into government grants, tax money going into these these things. Uh, then we see why the church uh, is sort of forced into compliance with all of these uh, various victim narratives because all this goods and services have to be uh, distributed in quote unquote a non discriminatory manner, and you cannot do any explicitly religious activity. So it's kind of fraudulent that we're mm-hmm. marketing this stuff as as ministry because if we're going to take this compromise and get into this money, then really the ministry is not what you can what you're doing anymore. You're you're prohibited from that. Right, for sure. And you know, and the the interesting thing to me is is. It's kind of like you have two parallel things that are going right along with each other, which is the whole, you know, gay Christianity, revoice, same-sex attraction, and then you also have the social justice. And I think a lot of times they are very paired, but it seems like for whatever reason with the social justice, we have the whole gay Christianity that's really that's, – that's the one sin that for whatever reason they're really targeting right now. Um, is that is that just try, is that just another leftist ideology that they're trying to bring into the church, or like what's what's the strategy? Like why are they trying to do this in all reality? Yeah, the strategy is that they if they can redefine family, weaken family bonds, uh, compromise the church, then there's less and less opposition to this larger agenda. And the um, you know the the push of the LGBT agenda is really key to that. That's when I try to tell people who are activists or straight allies, uh, Christians who are really for uh, gay marriage and so forth, that they need to realize that you know the gay community is being used. Uh, progressives use people; they don't mm-hmm. help them. And these progressive socialists are out to uh, sort of category uh, you know categorically divide people and then they put them in these basically these uh, work camps where they 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 work for the cause of pushing progressivism and socialism in a way that uh, now is deeply embedded in the church and in our narratives and they never help the people that they are supposing like the the war on poverty where um, I think 20 something trillion dollars in mm-hmm. uh, to the war on poverty since uh, Johnson. Uh, began that, and there's you know there's more sad you know poverty in in you know around us than than ever because you have an entitled um, culture that mm-hmm. will never escape that uh, sort of plantation of of progressive uh, socialism. So you know, and all these words is probably run off people's ears after a while, but to see the church deeply embedding itself in this and our leaders leading us into this stuff and calling it the gospel. That's what's new. Mm -hmm. It's never happened on this level. And you have to ask why. Step back. Why is the church making the gay issue the big issue at the same time as the last um, administration, the Obama administration, made the commitment to see that that the LGBT uh, win the future, Mm -hmm. win this whole big tent of LGBT that didn't even exist before uh, about 2007 is when that Big Ten approach started messing with, um, you know, with uh, terminology that ended up being LGBT, and now we see LGBTQI plus whatever. Mm-hmm. Um, this is all the Big Ten inclusion. Well, why does the church feel compelled to have this conversation? All these dozens of conferences, hundreds of books, and all these uh, hired guns who are uh, a gay lobby essentially. I'm calling them the. Uh, uh, the log cabin evangelicals. They're mm-hmm. like a gay lobby right here in the midst of the conservative church. Right. And uh, it doesn't matter if they're they're still cloaking themselves in celibacy. Obviously, the bigger goal is not to maintain the celibacy, but to use it as a segue to get acceptance. Right, for sure. And, you know, and I kind of wanted to dive into that just a little bit in the sense of what's wrong with with them saying that, well, you know, I'm gay. I I have these attractions. I'm I'm doing my best not to act out on them, uh, but if that's a part of me and I have these temptations, as long as I don't go after those temptations, why why is that wrong from a biblical from a biblical perspective? 
Well, it's mainly wrong because it's based on the assertion of orientation, which they say is not understood by the biblical writers, and so we're not even in a biblical conversation anymore. This Mm -hmm. is drawn out of the American uh, Psychological Association and uh, Christian or religious uh, psychologists who have helped develop that narrative that supposedly, actually, if you look in the APA's work, uh, on religious topics, and this is all interfaith. It isn't just for Christians, mm-hmm. uh, but they do have specific narratives uh, for Christians. But um, Mark Yarhouse is the chosen guy for the uh, the Gospel Coalition and others to sort of develop the narrative for the Reformed guys. But it's all based on orientation. It's an ex- extra biblical issue. As, if if orientation were real, they're not talking about temptation anymore. Or they're just talking about, well, that's just who, who I desire to be with. And then they develop the narrative from there. So it's on the, it's based on the wrong premise to begin with. Mm-hmm. Plus you start, uh, you're identifying that people are, if they're in, in the faith, then they have a, they, if they're homosexual, they have a homosexual or gay identity and, uh, and then sexual identity. Then they have a faith identity and those two need to be merged. Mm-hmm. That's the process that is being used here to produce the acceptance of gay Christianity. Well, the only uh, way that that can be done in a tradition that condemns homosexuality is uh, under the heading of celibacy. So then we have this side A and side B of the issue among evangelicals, where side A is like Matthew Vines, who are fully affirming of gay marriage. And then you have people like Julie Rogers, who was at Wheaton, Mm -hmm. who famously flipped from side B, which is celibate, you know, but, but still gay, over to side A. Once you get the record playing, the hits on side A, right? Um, so the side B are the celibate people, and all they have to do is flip the record and start singing the other tune. We see that, like with Revoice, uh, the guy Matt, uh, Nate Collins, who's a uh, Southern Baptist Theological Seminary grad and former teacher. Uh, he says he's side A, but he's he's not celibate. He's in uh, he's a homosexual married to a woman in what he called a mixed orientation marriage. Mm-hmm. That's another descriptor that they have designed. But um, he is with an organization called Love Boldly that is mostly side A people who are fully affirming, including Julie Rogers, Mark Yarhouse, this uh, APA guy, um, a psychologist, works with him as does Alan Chambers, who brought down Exodus International mm-hmm. and uh, from within. And so there's these really, you're looking at activists. There's a human rights campaign and two board members from Matthew Vine's organization that are on the board with Nate Collins of Love Boldly and Collins of Revoice, the founder, is actually doing a youth conference with Love Boldly, his sort of parent organization, uh, to uh, reach out with a Revoice message to your youth pastor and to your youth, and they're scholarshipping youth into the, this conference coming up next month. So they they want to bypass the senior pastors and staffers and the parents and take this revoice message of queer Christianity and um, LGBT inclusive Christianity straight to your teens in your own churches. Mm-hmm. So this stuff is this stuff is huge, yeah. and it's carefully crafted. And uh, the funding I've asked Nate Collins where the funding is coming from, but he wasn't going to speak to that issue. Yeah. Um, but as a matter of fact, he didn't want to speak at all once I asked him what the conclusions were from his years of study at southern right. seminary as to what his conclusions were as to gender because mm-hmm. his specialty is gender theory and feminist theory and queer theory mm-hmm. well that, and that's the, that's the interesting thing too is that they you know whenever there seem to be any kind of discussion online or whatever it is about it they always seem to kind of really shut down the conversation and i know there was even several uh pastors who were wanting to go to the revoice conference just to be there and be another voice and I know like Steve Camp offered to have coffee with some of the pastors and they banned him and threatened him with arrest. And I, there were several other, other people. I'm not sure if you were one of those guys too that were banned from attending Revoice, but that just seemed so over the top that they're trying to silence all all opposition. There's not even time to have a conversation or debate the issue or let's look at scripture together or anything along those lines. So just that alone is is very concerning about them infiltrating, especially into the youth and all that kind of stuff within the church. 
Um, now I know that you know because we're kind of talking a little bit about the change and some of the some of the leaders that have been voices within this. I know that you had just you know wrote an, wrote uh, an article and you said that it was you know one of the toughest you know articles you've written, but about like there's Al Mohler and how he's kind of changed his view uh, in regards to sexual orientation and that sort of thing. Can you kind of explain his arc of where? He used to be spot on when it comes to this kind of stuff, and now he seems to be compromising to a certain degree. Yeah, I link and quote an article that he wrote in October 2005. It's part two of homosexuality and theological perspective. Um, And he says the homosexual movement has employed a well-documented hermeneutic suspicion toward biblical texts which address homosexuality. He goes on then to say, This is a revisionist hermeneutic that, if applied to Romans 1, for example, uh, it's been employed to argue that the text means something quite different from the church uh, traditional interpretation. That's what we see with Matthew Vines. I attended Matthew Vines' uh, uh, meetings when he was here at a PCUSA church in Birmingham, where I live, and he just tried to deconstruct everything that the Bible says, and it's a very weak case. I mean, especially when he gets into... The Greek words in the New Testament, I mean, they're pretty hardcore. You, mm-hmm. you can't explain them away. But um, here's what he says in 2005, what Moeller says. The critical issue used as a hermeneutical device by the revisionists is the concept of sexual orientation. The modern, quote-unquote, discovery of sexual orientation is used to deny the truth claim clearly and inescapably made within the biblical text. What he's saying is that the argument of orientation, if it were real, if orientation were real, then it undermines the biblical text and its authority. Well, in, that's 2005. In 2014, at the ERLC conference, Ethics and Religious Liberties uh, Religion um, uh, Conference, where they had invited the Human Rights Campaign and a lot of gay activists, Matthew Vines, they're all there, invite all these Southern Baptists and other conservative and reformed pastors, and they have this conference on um, the gospel of homosexuality and the future of marriage. In that conference, Al Mohler stood up in 2014 and said he repented because he has been wrong about orientation. Mm -hmm. So he admitted that what he calls a quote-unquote discovery in 2005, implying that it's false, uh, he admits that it is real, and now that's not based on anything found in Scripture. It's solely based on what the American Psychological Association and most of its affirming uh, psychologists and counselors are are saying that orient there is some type of sexual orientation. And he uh, he Mueller goes on to say, well, even if you don't agree with it, you have to agree that there's something tantamount or akin to an orientation. So they're they're making this confession into some t- type of realm of mystery because people don't understand how the human psyche works. We don't know how things like abuse and other things affect people's uh, psyche. This is still a very m- mysterious, plus it's in the field of psychology, heavily influenced by atheists like Freud. You right, know? Yeah. So They've actually bowed the knee to Bale on this. Moeller bowed the knee to Freud, and to, who says that we're all born uh, bisexual, mm-hmm. you know, and just one wins out. Right. He's bowed the knee to this issue of orientation and has abandoned any validity to any scriptural argument, because then if people are oriented this way, that implies that God made them this way, which implies you can't, they cannot change, which implies you can't expect them to change. Mm -hmm. And that's what we see then in part 10 of this uh, biblically inclusive audit. No one would be pressured into expecting or seeking any healing or change that God has not promised any of us until the renewal of all things. They're saying that if you're same-sex attracted or homosexual oriented or whatever, uh, you've got to, that's who you are and that's how you're going to be until till heaven. Mm-hmm. You know? And you'll you'll see when the renewal of all things, you know, when we're not sexual creatures anymore, there's no more need for procreation, then you're not going to be dealing with that. But, right. um, you know, this narrative is so full of holes. It isn't biblical. And our job is to stick with the biblical narrative. That's Al Mohler's job. 
but then they try to come back in and, and reinforce this narrative when they've embraced uh, Mark Yarhouse and they've had him speak at, uh, at Muller Seminary. He's spoken at Reformed Theological Seminary. He's spoken at Covenant Seminary, where a lot of this stuff came from, uh, Covenant College here mm-hmm. in the south on Lookout Mountain. I think he's been there. Yarhouse has nine times, mm-hmm. mostly speaking in the chapel about same-sex attraction and and preaching the APA's gospel in the chapel of a conservative Bible school. It's crazy. Right. And what's happening. But what's interesting that I find about a lot of these kinds of debates, especially about social justice, about, you know, gay Christianity and that sort of thing, is everybody tries to make it seem like we we can all disagree on these things because it's, quote-unquote, secondary issues. But what I'm finding is that their excuses for a lot of this kind of stuff is, in fact, compromising the gospel. Because I mean, now we're de- now we're dealing with you don't now you, you no longer have to repent of all sin because that's just a part of you. Okay. If you if you take that same logic, you could pl- apply it to other sins. So is this is this why it's so important? Is that not only is it just important to get right, but it's also compromising the gospel? Right. Yeah, because you you do, in essence, you do redefine the gospel once you say that people who are experiencing homosexual desires are actually experiencing a an orientation that God uh, created them with, and then uh, they can't expect deliverance from the gospel. Doesn't promise change from that. That's the that's the assertion. Mm-hmm. What's what's sadder then is that these people who have a homosexual orientation are then uh, the co- the ones paying the real costly obedience to follow the faith because they're confined to celibacy or to these mixed orientation marriages that would in some way be less than fulfilling. So they're being cross bearers and they're to be celebrated as those who are really paying the price. That's part of the revoice narrative. That's part of Sam Albury's narrative. And honestly, as a Southern Baptist, third generation, I, I'm just, I'm still shocked some of the times when I see another layer of this being uh, brought right in the door without protest into the Southern Baptist churches. It's mm-hmm. like, wait a minute, you know, but it, it is happening. And we are, we're absorbing this stuff into our narrative and into our uh, worldview. Mm-hmm. And it's not biblical at all. So the the bigger problem then becomes if we're not able to command people to repent, then they're not going to find saving faith. They're not going to find help. Mm-hmm. And my ministry work with uh, the gay community, we worked with what were called transvestites in New York when I worked with Dave Wilkerson there for 10 years uh, off and on in the New York City uh, area, there were a lot of uh, pr- people who were uh, uh, male prostitutes who were in homosexuality, uh, a lot of people dying with AIDS. We eventually found uh, the city warehousing people who were dying with AIDS in old hotels, and we started going in there. If, if the government then starts to tell you, or even our own church leaders, that you can't call people to repentance, that you can't say homosexuality is a sin, mm-hmm. then we're robbing them of the gospel and the hope that it offers. So preachers who are going to be faithful to the Word of God are going to start getting sued, and some are going to be going to jail mm-hmm. uh, for inspiring uh, hate crimes right. or making hate speech. Mm-hmm. So we're really not that far away from that. Is that. And who got us there? In the Southern Baptist, uh, Russell Moore has played a key role in it, and he's the guy who's supposed to be representing us in and, and D.C. and protecting our religious freedoms and, and gaining, helping the church gain and keep an ethical understanding of what's going on in the culture. Mm-hmm. Instead, he's one of the lead guys selling it out and bringing in all this uh, – log cabin evangelicals into the discussion. Yeah, well, and, and talk about Russell Moore a little bit, because I know that, because uh, I, I followed him off and on over the years, and there's been a, a bunch of red flags for me, you know, everything from him, you know, his interactions with the Pope to just different, you know, political ideologies. And, you know, one, one, of the, one of the things that I'm really seeing right now within, it seems like both within the Southern Baptist and the Gospel Coalition of Reform Communities and that sort of thing is that you're not allowed to have a voice if you're conservative, Christian, but if you're bringing in the liberal ideologies, all of a sudden now you're allowed to have a voice. Um, but so how how does that play in with Russell Moore? Because it seems like he's really been pushing a lot of these leftist liberal ideologies into the church. 
Yeah, and I would say that Russell Moore is deceiving everybody uh, in the circle that uh, think that he's a conservative Baptist, uh, mm-hmm. because, uh, and, and I've had more dealings with him and his underlings than probably anyone on uh, on uh, Moeller's level with the seminaries, mm-hmm. but he is a graduate of Southern Baptist uh, Theological Seminary. He's a protege of, of Moeller. But before that, his first job, he was working in, uh, he was very active uh, in politics in uh, Biloxi, Mississippi, and he worked for Gene Taylor, who's a Democrat. Mm-hmm. He was a staffer for him, and uh, and then he came into uh, the circles with Al Mohler, and just as he graduated, uh, he was immediately made uh, provost, I think, at SBTS, and uh worked his way up and started teaching there straight out of his, his own doctorate Then he started teaching. And so he's been there for over 20 years. And in 2013, he was brought into uh, head as president of the Ethics and Religious Liberties Commission. And he immediately, uh, once he was installed in March, he made a press conference uh, um, uh, or an interview, rather, with, with the Wall Street Journal that raised a lot of eyebrows, including my own, where he said, the culture war is over, we lost, and we just need to love our gay and lesbian neighbors. So he isolated the conservative Christians by saying, well, you've waged the culture war and you've hurt the gospel. Mm-hmm. And then he isolated the issue of LGBT and said, that's where we really need to start changing the conversation. Well, what I found out by 2014 is that he was secretly meeting behind the scenes with Human Rights Campaign and other gay activist groups when he would not meet with me. Okay. And he would not meet with other people that I know who had uh, backgrounds who were raised by gay or lesbian parents who had concerns about gay adoption, about the church's compromise, about his compromise. But uh, Russell Moore would never engage. He, he uh, had an underling uh, call me back, and then uh, when I have, have had other issues uh, that I've tried to raise with him, they've just completely ignored them. Mm-hmm. But the problem is that Russell Moore is really um, admired by younger postmodern uh, reformed guys, especially out of Southern and some of the other seminaries. He's put up as uh, in front of uh, the younger Christian groups as someone very um, attuned to how the church can be relevant to the changes in the culture and not lose the gospel. That's one of his books, Mm -hmm. uh, is how to do this and not lose the gospel. But in fact, he is the one who is strategically replacing the gospel with a lot of this pro-gay ideology and narrative. And Russell then um, has hired other people who are political operatives uh, like the guy, um, uh, young guy, uh, Brent Leatherwood, who was mm-hmm. uh, working to subvert uh, candidates in Tennessee and as uh, executive uh, director of the uh, Republican Party of Tennessee. He, he tried to become chairman, lost that bid, was thrown out, was really disliked because of his subversive uh, working of, of um, conservative candidates and his never Trump mantra, mm-hmm. which made him popular with Russell Moore. And uh, and really, when they're telling us we're being too conservative, I mean, too uh, political, what they mean is we're being too conservative. Right. They're wanting Christians to be because the whole time that Trump is being attacked by Russell Moore, Trump even tweeted about Russell Moore, said mm-hmm. he was a mean and uh, heartless guy, something to that effect. Right. Uh, Moore was still working in the Obama White House, was very cozy, was invited to the Christmas party, mm-hmm. uh, the last Christmas party in the um uh, White House. Mm-hmm. So he's he's very political himself, but he points the finger and accuses us of being political. But this uh, uh, family conference that he's got coming up uh, in October at uh, Matt Chandler's church and um, in Dallas, uh, the keynote for the last meeting, the takeaway meeting of the uh, in, of the event, is Sam Albury talking about the definition of family as church Mm -hmm. and replacing the family and talking about same sex attracted. So uh, this is the same guy who's fresh off with this audit about sharing our children, trying to tell us that 
that are, the church is our real family, mm-hmm. and this is in the ERLC, Russell Moore Conference. These guys are up to something, and it's not good, and it's not the gospel. Yeah, and it's really interesting because you're talking about how, you know, guys like Russell Moore, they're not willing to, you know, talk to any, even, like, have have the discussion, it seems like. And it's like they don't want to be under any kind of criticism, or they just silence opposition. And I know that you had that run-in with them at the SBC, um, if, if you could just briefly kind of explain what happened there. I know you've told the story many times, but for those that don't know, kind of what, what briefly happened at, at that event? Well, I had broken the Revoice story in early May. I, I first discovered it in May 4th. We had an article and interviews out and going by May 10th. And so uh, in uh, June 11th, I think of... Uh, this year uh, it was the Southern Baptist uh, Convention's annual meeting in Dallas. So I went as a member of the press working for Worldview Weekend mm-hmm. with press credentials I had obtained in advance. I got an approval, and so I was there representing the Revoice story. Mm-hmm. I interviewed Al Moeller for about three and a half minutes. Uh, we played that interview on a couple of programs. Uh, I wrote about that interview um, but I was going around to as many of the guys as I could grab an interview with or who would comment. And uh, so I did uh, have the opportunity to ask Russell Moore uh, about Revoice, and he denied any knowledge of it, even though uh, one of his um, uh, ERLC fellows, Karen Swallow Pryor, is on the web page endorsing Revoice. Mm-hmm. And she's been a controversial figure in his, uh, in his stable anyway. But mm-hmm. then another um, guy who works for um, the ERLC and, and more as a consultant, uh, Brandon Polk, was actually a speaker at Revoice. And then Judd Saul, who is PCA but contributes to the ERLC, he was one of the guys mentoring Revoice and the setup of it. And then, of course, the founder is a Southern Baptist Theological Seminary grad. So uh, for mo- for more to deny any knowledge of it, especially after it had become a pretty big story by that time, over a month in, uh, then it was um, – uh, I don't think it was an honest response. And then mm-hmm. he told me he would look into it. Well, that was on, on the afternoon um, – uh, Tuesday and then uh, Wednesday, the last day of the convention, his ERLC report was coming up at four, and I was uh, doing a report to one of the to World Week Weekend from the floor mm-hmm. of the expo, and I was forcibly removed by police, and I had just seen uh, this guy Leatherwood, who works for the ERLC once he lost his job at the Tennessee <laughs> Republican Party. Yeah. He got hired by the ERLC. He was there. He was glaring at me. He disappeared. Within two minutes, the police came. And then as they escorted me out, saying I had threatened someone, uh, I was being forced to leave the building. It was just about an hour and a half before the ERLC report, which I would have been able to be in the floor and hear that. Mm-hmm. Um, and um, the uh, the guy Leatherwood joined the procession with the police as they escorted me out and was trying to escalate the situation and sticking his face around the officer trying to provoke me mm-hmm. uh, and, and glaring like, hey, I got you thrown out. It's, if I'd taken a punch, then it would have been an arrest. Oh, yeah, for sure. I'm tossed out. So, you know, and here's the guy. This was the day that Pence, uh, Vice President Pence, had been in the building. Mm-hmm. And the you know we were having to go through TSA security checks. I mean, security was very high, higher than at the uh, at the airport. Right. So to have somebody lie about me and say police I threatened someone really put me and anyone around me in harm's way. Mm-hmm. And by the time I got back to my hotel, the um, I went public with this, and then. Um, the uh, before I could get home the next day, the ERLC had sent out one of their public relations people to the press, and uh, the Christian Post uh, published a false article and false claims that I was not removed by the police. I was removed by the executive committee for trespassing, mm-hmm. and uh, I was in the expo, the public area of the expo. I mean, I, nobody's Which trespassing. Makes there. no sense. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Makes no sense, but I did get the police report, which confirmed my side of the story, but uh, the ERLC has completely ignored me. I've asked for an apology, 
and uh, I've uh, reached out to the executive committee because one of the executive committee members seen Oldham commented to the press and backed up the ULC story, which is now obviously false. I've asked for a retraction and correction from Christian Post, which is Richard Lamb, the former head of the ERLC, who wouldn't comment on revoice. And I ask him, I've asked them for a retraction. Their reporter never even called me, never contacted me, based his timeline and the whole story on two tweets that I yeah. put out. And uh, it's all false, but it just shows you how this stuff gets handled, and anybody who's asking the wrong questions. Uh, can get shuffled out of the way. Mm -hmm. What they're really after was to keep me from being in the room during that ERLC report. Right, which makes which makes sense with their background too, because it just seems like between your experience and then also how you know dealing with Revoice and how they just shut down everybody who has a different experience than or d different perspective than what they're promoting. It just seems like they're just trying to do whatever they can to control the narrative, silence any opposition at all. Um, you know, I was just uh, interviewing uh, Steve Camp the other day for this week's actual episode of Conversations. And, you know, we were, we were, set, we were talking about a lot of this kind of stuff. And I was saying it seems like the, the quote unquote leaders are having all of these conversations behind the scenes, not in the public light. And then they're just coming forward with these statements and these perspectives and then just kind of forcing it down everybody's throat. No room for conversation, no room for debate or anything like that. I just wish at a certain point we could actually just have the conversation because to a certain degree, we're all brothers and sisters in Christ. We should be able to debate this issue. But I just feel like there's so many arguments that um, are just being completely ignored and so many biblical perspectives that are being completely ignored from both the Gospel Coalition, from the Southern Baptists, from the ERLC, and all of these groups. At a certain point, why can't we even just have the conversation? That's what's really <laughs> concerning to me. Yeah, why are we acting like this? Mm -hmm. uh, you know, why are we forcing one point of view and, you know, and letting you know, this, uh, this gay lobby that they've appointed, like Albury and Butterfield and others, uh, why are they, uh, Jackie Hill Perry, which she wrote a really disturbing, you know, anti-heterosexual gospel article that John Piper put out, why are we letting those guys hog the microphone and be the only ones in the conversation? Mm -hmm. Why not people who've been delivered from homosexuality, who are married, who are clothed and in their right mind and, and have put this stuff behind them? Uh, why would we have people like Rosaria telling us that the, the gay community does community better than the church does? That is absolutely not true. Mm -hmm. I mean, when, uh, when I had spent those years working in New York and in areas where I've worked in, the, um, in resort uh, areas like Panama City Beach, Myrtle Beach, where there's always a large gay community, the gay community it does not behave well. They use people. The people we were ministering to in New York – who were in these um, welfare hotels had no alternative because once they got uh, a diagnosis of, of AIDS, they were thrown out like yesterday's garbage from, by the gay community. Mm -hmm. And the, the CDC talks about the drug use, the alcohol, the depression, the suicide, and the myriad of problems that are experienced by the gay community. Of course, they would tell us uh, in the gay community that is simply because we do not affirm them. Uh, right. Well, all the affirmation in the world can't change those realities. And then we've got somebody in the ERLC meeting or a gospel coalition meeting repeatedly telling us that the gay community does community better. And, you know, it's worse, you know, in some ways among gay males than among lesbians. But mm -hmm. I know uh, a lesbian community not far from where I live uh, where there are a lot of uh, women who are uh, bona fide man haters. They don't even let men on their communal property. Mm -hmm. And uh, I know some of them personally. Uh, there is a very rabid anti male culture among them. They're not doing community well. I right. think Rosaria is living in a dream world and she's preaching something very false yeah. uh, to the, the church. Well, in all reality, I mean, to a certain degree, maybe maybe they're doing good community within their accepted group, but not not in the same way that they're trying to project onto us of just accept everybody kind of a thing. So um, mm -hmm. now I know that uh, one of the you know kind of one of the last questions that I did want to ask was I feel like there um, 
there's been a lot of godly, you know, Christian leaders that have been very silent on, especially the homosexuality. Um, but there's been a lot of pastors that have been silent on this and the social justice. You know, finally, there was the statement that came out, uh, the social justice statement that came from the John MacArthur crowd and that sort of thing. Um, but why do you think it's been so long of just silence from a lot of these leaders to where now it's almost... Not that it's too late, but it's almost too late in the sense of it already has its stronghold within the church. Yeah, well, it's taken root in our seminaries, and I talk about this in um, one of my articles from last year, uh, where I simply ask, is this the evangelical deep state? There's part Mm -hmm. one and part two from December of last year. And uh, in that, I deal with um, some findings, especially from a book called The New Evangelical Social Engagement. That was uh, uh, put out in 2013, and I believe it's 2013. And then by uh, their citing that in 2013 that uh, the seminaries, 13 conservative evangelical seminaries, took their uh, curriculum and, and funding that came from the Kern Family Foundation in Wisconsin, they uh, took this funding programs in, and it's all part of the faith and work and uh, social justice movement. And this is big with Tim Keller. It's big with Reformed Theological Seminary. Southern Baptist Theological Seminary has taken these grants. Beeson Seminary, which is here on the campus of Stanford University in Birmingham, where I live, they've had four of those grants now. There's a lot of money being thrown around to indoctrinate the students at the seminaries into this false social justice gospel. Mm -hmm. It's developed, the curriculum is developed by a longtime gay activist priest whose name is Robert Sirico, and uh, that really got the attention of people in the conservative movement because he is firmly planted now as a a, a priest, uh, but his home in the Catholic Church, working among conservatives. But his work is far more libertarian, which doesn't deal with moral issues. It's mm-hmm. mostly economics and um, uh, and policy. But they ignore, you know, with a pretty broad um, approach. They go around any kind of moral issues. But uh, Sirico has helped develop this with Acton Institute and Russell Moore and Tim, Tim Keller is speaking at their luncheon luncheon of act and for mm-hmm. fundraising russell moore has spoken there these ties are very strong and um and it's a catholic uh <laughs> curriculum uh in our our evangelical reform seminaries right. it's a guy with a rabid gay faith uh activist past uh that he used to found metropolitan community churches he uh did gay from the first gay weddings in several states uh, this guy's a real radical. He was part of the um, Seattle gay scene and then later part of uh, the uh, movement to bring in a lot of the queer theology. Well, why are we getting curriculum from this guy? Mm-hmm. I mean, uh, he's not a conservative. He's libertarian. He's not a reformed guy. He's Catholic, and he has this radical homosexual history. Mm-hmm. Uh, that's whose stuff is embedding now in our seminaries and brainwashing uh, our young guys who are coming out. And I found this out when our church uh, hired a uh, staffer straight out of uh, Southern Seminary, and he was the most clueless guy I had ever met. We weren't able to ha- to connect mm-hmm. or to have any fellowship on any level, and I kept trying. I was the one who was um, uh, very uh, determined to establish a relationship with this guy because he's picking all the curriculum we taught and picking my son's curriculum. And um, it's disturbing that the seminaries are ruining a generation of pastors, but that's what's happening. That's where the social justice stuff is coming from. Right, for sure. Now, in closing, like what what do you think this like what's the solution to all of this? Because I know there's a lot of people that are going to be listening. Obviously, the majority of the people aren't going to be in these decision making roles within the Gospel Coalition or Southern Baptist or you know whatever it is. What's what's the solution overall in general? And then also, what can the rest of us do, or what should the rest of us be doing, just in our local churches, to make sure that this false teaching isn't expanding and grabbing even more hold over our local churches? Well, I think we've got to realize that it, that it is present, that it's not the gospel. 
I think that we have to uh, inform ourselves and we have to pray. And then we've got to confront our, we got to confront our pastors and our elders. Uh, that's not going to be a fun job. Mm-hmm. Uh, my wife mm-hmm. and I were um, tossed out of a church uh, because we confronted the elders uh, with some of this stuff, mm-hmm. which included them allowing a transgender uh, teen who was 15 at the time to be a part of the youth group and even a count, camp counselor in their summer camp with 600 to 800 uh, six to nine year old kids as a uh, as a trans. Mm-hmm. So uh, this was happening at conservative reform church. So the irony is you're you're going to run up against opposition, but you've got to stand for truth. Uh, the other thing is if your church is gospel coalition affiliated, which many are, and the people in the pew don't know it, mm-hmm. you have to find out if you're seeing this stuff trickle down through the pastor because he's the one who's most likely aligned the church with the gospel coalition. Given this church audit and it coming stateside and as it spreads, people do not need to subject their churches to this. They don't need to allow their pastors who are uh, following Tim Keller or um, Dever or Moeller to uh, bring this stuff into their churches. Uh, they need to reject it mm-hmm. and, re- and, and reject it in unison. There's strength in numbers, and unfortunately there's too many people being picked off because they take a stand alone and, you know, but, you know, if we do stand alone, the Lord is with us. I don't think you have to be (laughs) fearful of that. And um, I was told, you know, that uh, if I didn't pipe down, that no one would ever listen to me. And one pastor who I tried to confront with this made fun of the blog that I did, I'd set up. And Mm -hmm. of course, now that blog gets a, a good bit of readership. And, um, you know, we're talking about what was posted on it today. So right. uh, be a voice and take a stand because obviously there's a lot at stake. Your family's at stake. You've got to mm-hmm. really watch what's going on in your church and what they're trying to introduce, especially in curriculum mm-hmm. and even from the pulpit. Yeah. You know, and one, th- one thing that I say a lot of times is if you're not sure – like wh- where your pastor is either learning or getting his information from or where he's associated with, find out what books he recommends and what books he likes to read. And a lot of times you can tell a lot about their theology and associations just th- through that. You know, if they're reading a lot of Tim Keller or Al Mohler or a lot of those guys, chances are they may be being led astray by this and you just don't even know it until you find out kind of what's trickling down. So that very, very wise advice that you gave. So for the people that do want to keep up on what's going on and stay educated and be in the know, how can they follow you, uh, your website, all that kind of stuff, just so that way people can stay in the know with what's happening right now? Yeah, well, my, again, my, my site is 30piecesofsilver.org. You spell it out, mm-hmm. not the numbers. Spell it out, the words 30piecesofsilver.org. And it's just a WordPress site. It's real simple. Mm-hmm. And uh, I continue the research and posting things there. Worldview Weekend, you, mm-hmm. Janet Mefford, um, are helping get the word out. And mm-hmm. I've been on several other interview programs. So the um, the thing is, this stuff is not going to go away. As a matter of fact, we see them doubling down on it, especially since this uh, Revoice Conference raised such uh, controversy Instead of backing off of it, they're doubling down on it. So clearly they feel committed to this and Mm -hmm. they have to implement it. But I think one of the things you said is very true. We do see this at an unprecedented level uh, of late. And so you're going to have to pay attention. You're going to have to inform yourself, protect your family, and really engage the Lord in prayer and be led by the Lord on this stuff because it's here to stay. And it isn't going to uh, it isn't going to get better. This narrative is going to corrupt and, and leaven more and more in the uh, institutional church. For sure. For sure. So I, I really appreciate you. I really appreciate all the research you do. I mean, li- literally, like you read your articles and it's just citation after citation and documentation of everything. And so I really appreciate all the time and energy you spend on this and just getting the word out and you know, really keep up the work. And I really appreciate you taking the time to, you know, sit down with me and have this conversation and hopefully we can do it again sometime, hopefully under less, yeah, any, uh, less, uh, you know, pressure going on in the church, but <laughs> yeah, anytime. And, and I'm available if people want to, uh, 
they can find me on Facebook. I'm not hiding. And I do respond to people. If they email me through the blog, I, I respond to them. I, I don't have a forum discussion on the blog as I just don't have time to to manage all of that. And mm-hmm. a lot of people, you know, get a, get on those blogs and, um, you know, with uh, good intentions. But there are some who come on and just try to detract and troll. And right. you know that and you've seen that. So. I just don't have time to do that and do all the research and the writing and stuff I'm doing. But you're welcome, you know, there to contact me and, uh, you know, and ask questions, share your concerns or confirm, you know, some of what you're seeing. And I would encourage everybody, um, you know, this America, we all have an opinion Mm -hmm. and we're entitled to share it. Um, If God's indicting your heart about this stuff, start speaking up, start writing, start uh, telling people what you know Mm -hmm. and uh, engage. Yeah. And and don't and don't let a lot of the upper ups like the people that are in in power try to you know shut you down because that's another thing that's really happening a lot is they'll they'll say well you didn't go to seminary or you don't you don't know as much as we do so they'll try to silence any opposition so just stand firm and just keep plugging away and that's that's all any of us can really do you know so yeah. um, and but, try to go to the source first and mm-hmm. give people a, an honest Matthew eighteen approach. Mm-hmm. Just like I did with Nate Collins, I tried, you know, <laughs> and and when they reject that, then you just go public with it. You appeal to the body of Christ, right? And um, and people do love truth. People mm-hmm. know the word, and I don't think we're nearly as far gone as some of these guys who are so uh, tightly confined within their own little group. Uh, you know, tweeting and fist bumping together. I don't mm-hmm. think they get it that uh, there's still a lot of middle America out here. We're over, we're the evangelical flyover zone, mm-hmm. but, but we we still understand the Word of God. Yeah, and uh, we're not ready to let you uh, sell us out. For sure, for sure, totally. Well, thank you so much again, Tom. Uh, really appreciate you. Really appreciate everything you're doing, and just keep plugging away. And just know that uh, there's there's a bunch of us that are following you, and uh, totally support everything you're doing, and keep keep up the good work. Thanks, brother. Take care.